uh, nine, excuse me, nine. And then uh, we left off at verse 11, verse 11. All right, continuing on the teaching here, remember the contrast is about Christ with his new covenant versus the old covenant under Moses. Let me emphasize again, that way there's no confusion here. Notice right here, Old Testament, which we'll talk about the old covenant in Hebrews. In this old covenant, the author is concentrating on the Mosaic, not the Abrahamic. There are many covenants that happen in the Old Testament, if you're going to be honest, not just one. God made a promise to Abraham. God made a promise to Moses and his people. God made a specific promise to David. God made a promise to Noah. God made a promise to Adam, etc., etc. Now, we're actually going to be covering those covenants, which are the highlights of dispensationalism. Hopefully, we'll cover that a little bit tonight. But the Old Covenant, remember, like I said before, is referring to Moses. It is not referring to Abraham. So notice the split here. So I'll just put Abram because I can't fit Ham in here. But there's an old covenant with Abram and Moses. There are two. So why can't we believe the same thing with this covenant as well? When God made a new covenant, we can see the new covenant applied two different ways, just like the old covenant applied to different people. Same thing, different people here. The new covenant, remember I mentioned before, was Gentiles, and then another one was for Jews, which is applicable during the last days or the end times. So there are two applications here, two applications here, but to be quite honest, there are multiple, way more than just two for the Old Covenant. It's important to keep that in mind because theologians, commentators, especially Calvinists, they keep messing that up. When they look at covenant, they always assume one thing. They're one-minded. But if you read the Bible holistically, there is no doubt you can't just put Old and New Covenant and that's it. There are so many different covenants there in the Bible, and the New Covenant can be applied in different ways, just as much as the covenants uh, the covenant in the Old Testament applies in different people, applies to different people. These are distinguished from, notice, the testaments, the testaments. Now, in Hebrews, the mistake of the commentators and theologians is to put covenant as the same as testament. I will cover that soon. Now, is the author... Maybe you can use original Greek for that one, they might claim. And the same Greek word might apply with covenant and testament. So the KJV translators, they did it incorrectly or they did it where the translation is not clear enough by saying the word translation, uh, tr testament rather than covenant. That's what they might claim. But no, I believe that it is advanced revelation. I believe that the Lord had them correctly translated to testament to show the distinction. Does it share the same idea that the author is doing? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that yes, it follows the context of what the author is talking about, but no, because chapter 9, more specifically in its details, will be distinguished from chapter 8 in Hebrews when it uses that same Greek word. So, I will cover that part, and I will show you soon. Testament has been mentioned in chapter 9. That's what you want to keep in mind. The, the word testament has been mentioned in chapter 9. The word covenants, as we have discovered, is mentioned in chapter 8. Chapter 8. Same thing here. So, we are going to... Look at word for word in the verses now and see if it matches up with what I introduced to you about covenants and testaments. Keep that background information in mind as we cover every word in these verses so you don't get lost. 
Verse 11, but Christ become, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, before I cover the covenants and the testaments, uh, let me cover the meat doctrine here. First of all, explaining each and every word in those two verses and make sure my explanations match up. Basically, the author is saying that in contrast to the high priest at verses uh, 9 and 10, where they had to take the blood of the animals to enter into the holy place inside the worldly tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle, Christ is instead, he becomes a high priest of future good things to come that has a lot more benefits compared to the Old Testament high priest. Because he comes through, he comes with a greater and a more perfect tabernacle. Meaning then this is not the same Mosaic tabernacle that the Old Testament high priest went through. Then what is this tabernacle? The clue is given where, in verse 11, not made with hands. So it's not an earthly tabernacle made by earthly human hands. This has to be a heavenly tabernacle. So there is a tabernacle up in heaven for some people who didn't know that in the Bible. So Christ, he went to a more perfect tabernacle in heaven. So then God has his own tabernacle. And remember, like I mentioned to you before, uh, God's tabernacle, which is more perfect than Moses' tabernacle, has been copycatted, has been imitated by earthly figures. One example is Noah. He built the earthly tabernacle to mimic some of the things that are built in heaven. Then uh, we get those uh, strange structures like the Stonehenge and the pyramid, remember that one, where they try to copy the patterns of the heavens and then I've given you my theory or my two cents on that one, which I don't know was interesting or not, you know. <laughs> so this tabernacle in heaven, there is no doubt about it. Everybody on the earth is trying to copycat that one. Jesus Christ went up there Notice the last part of verse 11, that is to say, not of this building. So Paul is saying, the author is saying, it's not uh, a building on this earth. Verse 12, neither by, the blood of, uh, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. And then I read the remaining part to you earlier. Jesus Christ did not enter into this more perfect tabernacle in the heaven by the blood of animals. He entered it through his own blood. Now remember the contrast. The author is contrasting that with the high priest who went inside the earthly tabernacle with the blood of animals. So to get to heaven, you notice right there, it shows a meaning here. To get to heaven, to access the tabernacle, you need to have innocent blood, right? In the earthly tabernacle, they had to do that with innocent blood of animals, but in the heavenly tabernacle is the blood of Christ. How many of you are washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Hey. Hence, you have access to the heavenly tabernacle then. It's the only way that you can do that. And when Jesus Christ did that, he obtained, he earned it, he accomplished, received redemption for us. He bought, uh, redemption means to buy back to buy back, and it's eternal. It's fixed. If that blood is eternal redemption, how, then it's got to be eternal blood. What does that mean? So then John MacArthur is wrong. John MacArthur, who teaches a heresy where he doesn't think that the blood of Christ is a big deal. No, it is a big deal. This precious holy blood it didn't just sap and disintegrate at the cross. We believe that this is God's blood. 
If it's God's blood, God is eternal, yes? So this blood is special blood here. That ain't just human blood, that's God's blood. So MacArthur, he's trying to make it where Christians get spooked that, you know, we try to turn that blood into some kind of mystical thing. And if Jesus Christ were to get a paper cut, so to speak, and his blood dripped out, you know, people would worship it or something like that or go, oh, this is very special blood, holy blood. See, he's trying to do that. Uh, he's trying to explain it in that way so that people can be spooked about Jesus' blood and then degrade it a bit. No, that's not what we're saying right here, because... Even if you talk about physical blood on earth, let's even assume that his blood that he has has some kind of physical resemblance or it is connected physically. The point is, spiritually, that blood washes away our sins. That's a spiritual transaction, not a physical transaction. So we believe that because the spirit is eternal, yes? If the spirit is eternal, that blood has some spiritual, eternal significance. And no, I don't mean symbolically, I mean spiritually. That was MacArthur's problem. He makes the blood something symbolic. He says, because he got so much heat on that, he's saying, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not trying to say something, you know, that the blood of Jesus Christ is not important. No, it is important. It is part of our salvation. I don't deny it. But it's more of a sim what it represents. See, that's what he's trying to drive at. It's symbolic about the atonement, about the forgiveness. No, it's much more than that. It actually has the power to wash it away. Literally, literally. Even if not physically, literally. Yeah. Where? In the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm. It, it's an actual transaction that happens. No, it's not just some kind of pictorial or symbolical representation or metaphorically uh, figure something. No, no, no. It's a literal thing. Amen. Literal. You know how you get your faith swayed away by something basic in basic doctrine about the blood atonement? You know how you get swayed by that? A big name and a degree behind you. That's it. That's all it takes, a degree and a big name behind you, and then people will listen to you, whatever you say. And make sure you sound good. Then people will listen to you. You got to look at the scriptures. You got to look at the scriptures. You notice right here, as we continue on, we'll show the eternal connection here. The Bible says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Meaning, from each and every word, that if the blood of innocent animals and the ashes where they were burnt on the altar were used to sprinkle by the high priest for unclean things, and it was intended to clean the flesh. It was intended to make things clean. Believe it or not, there are some scientific studies, which is very interesting, that what the Old Testament priest did uh, with the blood of the animals and maybe even their ashes, that it did some kind of uh, cleaning physically of their bodies. But even if that's not the case, there is a spiritual significance right here. Because remember, in the Old Testament, what they did by the physical deeds of their bodies was important for their salvation, was important for their relationship with God in the Old Testament law. Everything was fleshly. Remember, the law of Moses is called fleshly carnal ordinances. Recall that? If that was intended for the cleansing physically, uh, for the physical part, then in verse 14, how much even more so is, blood, is Christ's blood? Because it's not physical fleshly. Oh, MacArthur's wrong. It's spiritually eternal. Right? Look at the verse. Is that what it said? Don't listen to Johnny. All right? Look at the verse. Don't listen to MacArthur. Look at the verse. It's done through the eternal spirit. It's contrasted from verse 13, physical animals, physical blood. 
Am I right or wrong? All right? Don't just agree. Look at the verse. All right? I'm not, I'm not uh, hypnotizing you. I'm not trying to tell you to listen to me. I'm actually critiquing you and making you look at the verse. It's contrasted, is it not? They're contrasted. The spiritual realm versus the physical realm. Don't tell me that Jesus' blood it has no powerful significance. It did something in the spiritual realm here. Mystical? <laughs> Uh, John MacArthur was in a mystical plane when he said that. He's in a mystical fantasy land right here. I don't know who buys his reference Bibles or who would waste money to buy his reference Bibles. Something else, man. You notice right here it's done through the eternal spiritual realm, his blood. So it enters an eternal spiritual realm. And when Jesus Christ offered himself to God as an animal sacrifice, just like the Old Testament mentioned, the animal sacrifices are without spot. So it's clean. It's innocent. Jesus Christ was like a clean animal when he gave himself as a sacrifice. And that blood did it not say that the blood, which is eternal, spiritually purges. So it cleanses out. You know where Charis, uh, Catholics get the word purgatory from? So the only two mentions of purgatory in your Bible, which will be purged, you know where they are? This is one of them right there. This is one of them. So if you want to call it burning out, cleansing out the sin, fine. Look at this. It cleanses, burns out the conscience. So whatever you're struggling in the conscience, it burns it out, cleanses it out from dead works to serve the living God. So your works are dead works, referring to the dead flesh. Uh, you notice in the Bible a mention uh, that God will bring every work into judgment, whether it be good or evil. So the idea about dead works here is referring to your sins. That's what it's referring to right here. It's referring to your fleshly uh, sinful deeds, the bad works or the dead works. That's why at the judgment seat of Christ, when your works are burned, See that? It's perched, so to speak. Yeah. Those works are dead, the ones that are burned. Does that make sense so far? So that's what it's referring to, the dead works in your conscience. It's cleansed so that you can continue to serve the living God. Amen. And you feel like your life is more alive than ever before. Amen. That's the whole idea. Okay, let me give you two truths here, which is very interesting. Amen. This is entering, which we agreed, the spiritual realm. Yes? It is all entering inside the spiritual realm, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's entering in the spiritual realm, another thing to keep in mind is that it is eternal. If it is eternal and entering the spiritual realm, excuse me, entering the spiritual realm, the question we need to ask ourselves when we keep reading that verse it says that it purges our conscience from dead works. Amen. Well, people are everywhere. How can the blood of Jesus Christ any time, any place, anywhere, cleanse our conscience from its filthiness? How can it do that? If it's entering a spiritual realm and it's eternal, that would make sense. Amen. See that? So it is eternal in its longevity. It is also spiritual, which shows uh, pretty much it can go anywhere and everywhere and anybody. This eternal spiritual plane where the blood of Christ enters, it is everywhere in our universe, that means. If it is anywhere, everywhere, and the time periods that span from the cross till doomsday. So the blood of Christ is everywhere in our universe. It is spread out. Amen. If we were to simply confess to the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation, we can claim that blood and that blood can purge our conscience from our dead works and cleanse us of all our sins, no matter what time period you're at, Amen. ever since the time of the cross till doomsday, and no matter what place and location you are, and no matter who you are. So you can get it. If it's traveling throughout the entire heavens, if that statement is true, then think about this. 
people talk about when Jesus Christ, uh, it sounds really great, but there's an incorrect part there, that when Jesus Christ died, he went into the third heaven, poured the blood on the mercy seat. That sounds great, but there's an incorrect statement there. It shows a limitation, nevertheless. Now, I say that, and other preachers may have said that in our church, and I can go for that, but that is very limited. You might say, why is that limited? Because that blood is not just on that mercy seat over there. It's everywhere. So the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is not just here in the mercy seat. It is throughout the whole heavens itself, throughout the whole universe. That's what I believe. Uh, the verses to prove this significance and this spreading out are as follows. First of all, we look at the chapter itself. The chapter itself is evidence. Notice that uh, the verse says in, let's see here, verse 23. It was therefore necessary. Necessary, right? That means it has to be true. Just like evolutionists and atheists, they believe the scientific laws out of necessity must create our universe. Well, if they believe it that empirically strongly, which is still wrong anyway, from what we learned in our class, then notice how God uses that same wording, necessary. That means as strong as, more strong, as strong as science itself, that the patterns of things in the heavens, see that? Everywhere in our universe, should be purified with these. What's the context referring to? Christ's blood, when you look at verse 22, because 22 is being contrasted with Old Testament animal sacrifice blood. But 23 is contrasting that with Christ's blood. Amen. See, it's purifying throughout the entire heavens, the universe. Let's look at Colossians 1, Colossians chapter 1. Notice right here that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ said it is spread throughout the entire universe. That's the reason why it can pretty much, in a sense, reconcile all things, whether heaven, earth, or throughout all creation, because it is spread out everywhere. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. Colossians chapter 1. And then uh, we will read verse 20. The Bible points out here, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. So it's through the blood, right? Yeah. All things. What does all things mean? By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. That means everywhere throughout all creation. All the universe itself. You're going to say that this is simply a picture then? Really? You're high on crack then, yeah. if you're not heresy. Amen, so, and that's being nice, all right? If you don't want me to call you a heretic, then you're high on crack in a nice way. Because there is no stinking way when you look at those verses that that blood is simply just a symbolism or a picture. This thing is spread throughout the entire universe itself. That, why? Because of literal, not pictorial, literal power in the spiritual realm. See, they, he overlooked the spiritual realm. He's just limiting everything to humane stuff. Oh, it shows how humanistic MacArthur's mind is then, Secular. rather than spiritual, rather than scriptural. You teach it. Now, here are some other interesting factors concerning about the blood of Christ. Now, this is Dr. Ruckman's teaching. Me, I am still unsure myself. But there is no doubt that he, he's on to something here, which I'm going to cover. As you know, there is a sea of glass, which you and I know in the heavens. In this sea of glass here, which is found in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis, uh, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 1, it talks about the waters. And the waters that were under the firmament and above the firmament. And then those waters, when you compare that with Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 15, that is no doubt referring to the sea of glass. 
I mean, that's strong evidence. For some of you who don't know that, uh, you can watch my video, Deeps in Outer Space. I just don't have time to go through that one right now. I covered it in my Genesis commentary a bit, so I won't do much in this one. But there are waters in the deep there, which is when you pass the sky, you hit then outer space, and at the end of outer space is the sea of glass, which is the floor of heaven. Then past the sea of glass is heaven itself, the third heaven where God lives. If that's the case, Dr. Oatman believes that when Jesus Christ entered the heavens with his blood, he dumped the blood over here in the frozen uh, sea of glass. Now notice right here, it looks like a red sea, which is very, very interesting. And Paul talked about that those Jews, that they received baptism, that God considered it baptism when they passed through the Red Sea. Why would God consider that baptism? What about Joshua and the Israelites? Didn't they pass the Jordan River? Why didn't God consider that baptism? Think about that one. So that means, and there's something more significant about this bay of water, this body of water here to the Lord. So why is it called Red Sea? Maybe because of what Christ would do later on in the future. Think about this. Why is it in water baptism? It pictures, now that's a picture. That's not literal, all right? Now that's a picture. That's where MacArthur can get it right. This is where Campbellites get it wrong. They think it's literal. They teach the blood of Christ is in the water. So, no, no, that's silly, you know. I'll tell you what, all that water we drained out of the baptismal tub, then we disgraced the blood of Jesus Christ then, all right? But that is a picture. They're onto something. It's a picture. Baptism is a picture when we immerse in the water of death. So it is the death of Christ, burial, and then when we come out of the water, resurrection, right? So there might be some connection right there with water baptism about the blood being in there. Here's another one that's very interesting is that why is it that there are many miracles in the Bible? The Lord will turn waters into blood. Thought about that one? I mean, you could turn it to acid or lava. Why would God turn it into blood? Remember, when God does things, he does things. Now, I'm not the one that's crazy. Our brother Tom is crazy, all right? He's the one that says so, that when there's a verse, when Jesus does a miracle, there must be some reason. So you all blame him, all right? So he's the crazy guy. So if what he said was true, then when Jesus did these miracles, he's not doing it out of coincidence. When God does these miracles, he's not doing it out of coincidence. He does things for a reason. Another thing to keep in mind, here's a bigger one. Jesus Christ, he took the new wine, right? He says, this is my blood, which is shed for you. In the miracle in Cana, he turned water into wine. Could that be a reason why Jesus told Mary, my time has not yet come? Why did he say that? What's he trying to point out here? Maybe about he's seeing his death, mm -hmm. his blood being shed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get you thinking, right? Get you thinking right here. Here are some, uh, yeah, okay, it sounds right. <laughs> like, let it swim over your head and then I'll need some time to ponder on that one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that sounds like the right answer here. Now here are some other inter more interesting factors from Dr. Ruckman concerning about uh, the blood that was shed, and if it had any kind of uh, value in the Bible to other things. So here are some other things to consider about the blood of Christ and the sea of glass. Dr. Ruttman says on page 208 of his Hebrews commentary, he says, There is a door or opening through this sea of glass which is like, so Jesus Christ obviously had to go to heaven, right? And the Bible says there's a door open in heaven. You recall that one at Revelation chapter 4? How can there be a door if the sea of glass doesn't have a door on it, right? So that makes sense. Sea of glass will have to have an opening there or a door. So this opening, which is likened to a tear or rip, 
in a veil or a piece of clothing. Remember the Holy of Holies when Jesus died? The veil was... Remember Jesus' garments, which the universe is likened to at Hebrews, I think chapter 1? Oh, oh, okay then. Something there. Something there. By the way, why would God tear the veil? Thought about that? Why would God tear the veil? Something going on up there? If that veil is supposed to picture heaven too, right? All right, here's another one. If the city of Jerusalem, as well as the temple, is some, is some kind of type of the heavens, see Hebrews 9, 23 to 24 in comments, then the 12 gates on the earthly Jerusalem have some anti-type in heaven. Three of those gates are called the fish gate, the sheep gate, and the horse gate. See Nehemiah 3, 1, verse 3 and verse 28. You fish for men, and they go up through the water and into the gate. You call your flock up to the sheep gate, John 10, 1 through 6, at the rapture, and you lead them out at the second advent on horses, the horse gate. See Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 28. Woo, that's something right there, yeah. Over my head, yeah. Something is going on in that book that original manuscripts would shed no light on in the hands of any Bible-rejecting fundamentalist. When Christ dies, he sheds all of his blood. John 19, verse 34. His resurrection body is flesh and bones without blood. See Genesis 2, 23 and comments in that commentary. When the Lord Jesus came down through that water, he picked... So when he came down through that water, down to the earth, that's what he meant. He picked fishermen for his first two disciples and allowed himself to be immersed in water at the inauguration of his ministry, John the Baptist, Jordan River. When he went back to heaven, he went back up through that water twice. John chapter 20, verse 17, Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 10. By now, we have lost R.A. Torrey, Jimmy M. Gray, C.I. Schofield, Bobby Sumner, John R. Rice, Lee Scarborough, B.H. Carroll, Lee Robertson, Curtis Hudson, Marshall Neal, Laird Harris, Richard Clear Waters, Harold Wilmington, Kenneth we Kenny West, Willie Scroogey, G. Campbell, Morgan, E.S. English, and Eddie Hinson. So the thing to do is just pretend that since all of them thought they were smart enough to correct the book somewhere, none of them could handle the passage or anything in it. <laughs> we will pretend just that, he says sarcastically. <laughs> When the Lord Jesus Christ sheds that blood, beginning at Gethsemane, a transaction is taking place in the realm of physics that no modern physicist or fundamentalist knows anything about. As surely as Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7 through 9, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 through 15, describe an invisible warfare that took place literally between Matthew 26 and 28, so Hebrews 9, 21 through 26 describes an invisible catalysis that was transacted in this universe without one eye observing it. That's something right there. He also says right here, uh, the Roman Catholic Mass with this transubstantiation uh, is the pagan counterfeit of this genuine universal metamorphosis. No real Bible believer could have failed to notice the following. Adam's water circulation turned to blood. Pharaoh's rivers turned from water into blood. Tribulation sinners having their water turned to blood. Christ's transubstantiation of water into a type of his blood. The miracle in Cana, John 2. The identity of the eternal spirit and eternal blood with water. Where? Go to 1 John 5. Why would the Bible c combine these three witnesses as strong as the witnesses of the Trinity? Hmm, that's interesting, right? Go to 1 John 5. 1 John chapter 5. Let's go by the witness of the Trinity first. Since that's the greatest, 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 
And there are three that bear witness in earth. The spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Woo, that's something right there. The water above the solar system became a red sea at the death of Christ. So, whoo, that's something right here. Dr. Upman says, what we have here is the most potent dye that has ever stained 400 trillion tons of water. We have blood that does not dry up and evaporate in the first century. Only the physical components visible to the eye dried up on Golgotha's hill and Gethsemane's bloody garden. God's blood is not to be disposed of in that fashion. God lives forever. Therefore, his blood is still available. It can be applied in the spirit realm. That's something there. All right, so like you, I'm lost. Like you, that was a lot of information. I'll need time to think and pray and ponder those verses. But I thought that you would get a blessing from hearing it because there's no doubt he's on to something. Even if he's wrong, even if he's wrong, there's something he's getting on to. There's something he's getting on to. I think if modern scholars today recognize how Socrates and Aristotle were wrong on things, but they said, but they were on to something. So it just showed how smart they were, not dumb they were. I think we can give the same kind of credence to Dr. Ruckman as well. All right? Only an unintelligent, uneducated person will say that you're nuts, you're crazy after that. I mean, in higher ed school, I mean, they recognize that uh, the scholars from back then were wrong, but because of that thinking, it opened up to something. All right, anyway, that's something for them to think about to the critics. Okay, go back to Hebrews. Back to Hebrews. See, I played higher ed field, all right? I know their game, and I know the folly. People just don't expose it often. So I like to expose their psychological tactics that they don't really tell their students. It needs to be said. A lot of people don't know that. So you'll notice those kind of hints that I give to you, right? All right. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, and then uh, we'll resume on at verse 14. So a second thing to keep in mind is that we can see with our salvation, that's pretty obvious, right? Anytime, any place, you can get your conscience clear. But what about you as a saved living Christian? I get it in my salvation, but what about after my salvation? It is still available and can still cleanse you. During your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that blood has access and power to cleanse it, and you can claim it for yourself. But isn't my soul saved uh, and my sins of my soul are cleared? Yeah, but what about your body? See, so whatever sin you commit in your body, doesn't your body have to pay the price of it? Wouldn't you like forgiveness and clearance of those sins too so that God don't punish yes. your body? Yeah. I don't know about you, but uh, yeah. I do. Hyper dispensationalists can get away with it if they want to and then they'll receive a big spanking from God if they deny that doctrine. All right, so let's look at 1 John chapter 1. Hyper dispensationalists, they deny this verse because they say it's a tribulation epistle. But they deny the application to Christians as well. Tribulation, uh, excuse me, general epistles, transitional epistles will have tribulation and Christian application. I told you that, double application. So this is what we believe as Christians, that the blood can cleanse us. Look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, John is including himself as a saved believer, yes? If we confess, present tense, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, in case some people think that this has to do uh, with salvation, that is not true. That is fellowship. Because look at verse 6. If we say that we have what? Fellowship, fellowship with him and what? Walk. walk in dark. See, that's Christian walk. Christian fellowship, not salvation. Now, currently, are you not walking in the spirit? Aren't you? But isn't there times you walk in the flesh? So doesn't this have application to you then? Yes. Yeah. 
then I don't care if you're a hyper dispensationalist, a Christian can commit that action in verse 6. Yes. Why? Because Paul said so, not John. Paul said that in Galatians 5. He warned them not to walk in the flesh, but walk in the spirit. Yeah. So this can happen to us right here. Notice if you walk, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. But look at right here. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. See that? So the blood of Jesus Christ can be the cleansing agent during your walk, during your fellowship, when you mess up. Do you mess up in the flesh? You know, uh, those hyper dispensationalists. And believe it or not, even those who don't know much dispensationalism, like Joseph Prince, teach this heresy that you don't have to confess and plead the blood of Jesus Christ because at salvation, it's already been taken care of. What about your flesh? Look at Galatians chapter 5 and Galatians 6. Galatians 5, Galatians 6. Now, these are already saved brethren. All right? Look what Paul says to say, brethren. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the what? So you can mess up in the flesh then, it's saying, even though you're free. How about that? Look at verse 16. You can walk in the flesh. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why would he tell them to do that if they won't fulfill the lust of the flesh? If they won't walk in the flesh? See, Paul is warning to save Christians. Are those hyper dispensationalists listening? Including Joseph Prince. Notice right here that when you look at verse 19, now the works of the flesh, I didn't say your soul, all right? Your soul is secured. It's sinless. It's spotless. But your flesh ain't. And if you say your flesh is, then uh, let me repeat it again. You're high on crack yeah. if you're not a heretic. And that's a nice way to say it. Come on, you're going to tell me you're, you never sinned in your body? Come on, what sane person would say, I never sinned in my flesh? Now look at right here. Now the works of the flesh. What did your flesh work, act it out? Manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. How about that? That's pretty bad. Now, look at uh, verse, uh, verse chapter 6. Chapter 6, and notice what Paul warned at verse 7. Verse 7, be not deceived. Oh, but Joseph Prince got deceived. Hyper dispensationalists got deceived because they overlooked this part. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. How if my sins were already forgiven? How if they're cleansed by the blood? I'm not going to reap what I sow unless you're talking about the mess that I made in my flesh. Come on, you're telling me I don't care how hyper dispensationalist you are. You do that. You keep smoking this. Your flesh will pay the price. I don't even need scripture for that. The evidence is shown if you were to do that. Verse 8, For he that soweth to his flesh of the flesh reap corruption. Okay, plain. That applies to every man. That applies to every man. So you have to understand right here that um, when it comes to the flesh, you have sins in there that God's going to make sure you pay for. If you don't want to pay for it, you better plead the blood and confess it. All right, now here's another one. Look at um, a first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5. This is the standard text. This is the standard text that proves it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now this is your beloved Apostle Paul, hyper-dispensationalist. They pride so much in Paul. So if you pull up verses like 1 John or any other book in the Bible that's not Pauline, and they'll say that doesn't apply to us. But notice right here I'm pulling up Pauline verses that complemented with that general epistle, that has application to that general epistle. Now look at 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says this in verse 10, for we must, that's including Paul himself, 
all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his soul. Did I read that correctly? Body. In his body. See, that's what God's judging you for. Why would God judge me if I'm sinless and going to heaven? You're right. Why would God judge you? Unless there are things that you fail to do in your body for him, things that you messed up in your body. May receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be what? Good or bad. Good or bad. You've been a good boy or a bad boy. It's that simple. All right? So that is very plain right here. That's why you need that blood of Christ to cleanse it. Yes. So you can receive forgiveness. Amen. All right, let's go back. Let's go back. I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. So we can claim verse 14 for ourselves. Purge your what? Conscience. You see that? If those verses that I pointed you out was true, that it's not just salvation, but also your fellowship, also your fellowship with Jesus Christ, then keep in mind this. That means that verse, purging your conscience, is not just salvation. It is also right now for you. So isn't that a blessing? Meaning then, what are you struggling in your conscience? What are you going through right now? Certain thoughts have a stronghold on you, certain bad habits. You know what you do? What you do is that you plead the blood. Yes. What you do is you surrender those things to the blood of Christ. Yes. Have you tried that? It's one thing to uh, always pray and then, you know, pray for victory and then try your best to serve God. But what about praying more specifically for the blood this time? Plead the blood of Jesus Christ, name the specific sin, bring that image or those words in your conscience to him in prayer and say, it's that one, God. Yes. It's that one, Father. I plead the blood over that and then have that cleansing agent just wash it all away Amen. and surrender it. Amen. Dr. Upman believes that it never failed for him one time. Yes. There are many Christians who also can testify to that fact. Now, I am, uh, I am open to some people. They're still struggling some things here and there. So don't get me wrong with that one, all right? I can be empathetic toward that. But if these people believe that it had that much power, there is no denial then. At least it, has a significant, it can be a significant help. You can't deny that much. It will be a great significant help to you. So whatever you're struggling in your conscience, surrender that to the blood and plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse it. Amen, these, we these weirdos who, don't even ha who can't even run a church because they're so, home they're so hopeless and homeless themselves that they look like homeless bums, post videos on YouTube, criticize yours truly about he's getting into witchcraft, about there's power in the blood, pleading the blood. Sounds like Johnny Boy right here. Sounds like Calvinist MacArthur right here. So if he's not a heretic, then the nice way to say it, he's really high on crack. All right. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15. The Bible says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Okay, now I'm going to cover a lot of things over here. So let me explain each and every word from this passage. In verse, starting verse 15, see how my explanations match up? So for that reason, because of, the blood of Christ, because of that blood of Christ, that became the reason and cause that he became the mediator of the New Testament. The mediator of the New Testament. So he mediates, he reconciles two parties, obviously between us and God. He's mediating on our behalf. For the New Testament, so a New Testament can be a force. It can operate.
because of his blood that he shed, meaning because he died, the act of dying. When he died, the New Testament, boom, operated like that. Now, remember that there's a transition as well. You see this dotted line? So I am open to, trans, uh, to transitions. But from this verse, we also see that God enacted or started the New Testament at that time when Jesus Christ died. That by means of death. See, I told you so. It's through... Uh, the means of death. That's why you can enact it. Because of the transgressions or the sins that were under this Old Testament timeline. See that? See this division right here? This blue division here? That's all Old Testament here. This part is all New Testament. This is all Old Testament here. Excuse me. All right. He redeemed them. So he bought them back. Because remember, people in the Old Testament, their sins could not be cleared. The blood of animals don't clear away or wash away their sins. The blood of Jesus Christ did. That's why I told you before, they couldn't go to heaven. They had to go to where sins are located. Where are sins located? Underneath the earth. That's where hell is. That's where Abraham's bosom is. That's why even in baptism, our picture of the sins being buried with Christ that's very important. Uh, we see right here that the next part of verse 15, those uh, that are called, uh, you and I have been called by God, right? When you, when you called upon the name of the Lord, you've been called by him, you're saved. You can receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So we see right here that we gain the promise. We're able to inherit heaven up there. That is a blessing. Amen. When there's a testament, then there's got to be the death of a testator. So the question is, the Old Testament, who died then? That way the, testament can, the Old Testament can operate. The animals, obviously, they die. So their blood being shed enacted that Old Testament under Moses. Think about why in Genesis, even at the beginning, God had to kill a lamb. That would be re reasonable for Adam and Eve. Got to get that testament operating because they fell. All right. See, there are things that you have to consider. Verse 17, for a testament, uh, verse 17, the testament is operating. That's what is a force means. Once the men are dead, once there is death. Otherwise, the testament has no strength, it has no power if there is no death, when the testator is still alive. So there must be death. This is where Calvinists mess up, and Calvinists, they teach the heresy uh, called covenant of grace. They believe there are two covenants. It's called covenant of works and then covenant of grace. And you might go, where did they learn that from? I didn't see that in the Bible. You're right, where did that come from? I didn't read that in the Bible. I'm just as lost as you, all right? Only Calvinists will teach something weird like that. So, if we were to cover the covenant of grace and works, the idea is this. The covenant of works is an operation during, uh, before the fall and after the fall. That's the idea. So, the millennial, so if they believe in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, it's from there, after the fall, and then before the fall. This was during their time in the Garden of Eden. The covenant of grace. Did I move the whiteboard? Everything's okay angle-wise? All right. The covenant of grace was enacted ever since uh, God clothed Adam and Eve with lamb skins. So supposedly this salvation by grace continued from Adam all the way to uh, the, through the tribulation before the millennium. Now, look at that. That's a Calvinist doctrine. A lot of King James only, even those who claim to be dispensationalists, support this anti-dispensational Calvinist teaching. The opposite of dispensationalism is covenant theology. See those words? Covenant works, covenant of grace, covenant theology. That's all Calvinist stuff. That is anti-dispensational. So, 
the funny thing is that, well, it's not really funny, but it's just so weird how these people who profess, profess to be King James only or dispensationalists, they follow the Calvinist trend here. The Calvinist trend and Calvinists who are anti-dispensational. The idea is, is salvation by grace without works has always been the same from the beginning of the Old Testament after the fall of, uh, excuse me, uh, at the fall of Adam to uh, the end of the tribulation. That is wrong doctrine. That is heresy. That is wrong, wrong teaching. That is Calvinism. That we believe there are different salvation plans here. It's not just a one salvation by grace from beginning to doomsday. As I've told you before, and we've seen it at the book of Hebrews, there is a work salvation. I'm not denying faith. There has always been salvation by faith, pretty much, from ever since the beginning to now. But it's faith and works. We saw tribulation timeline for the Hebrews in the book of Hebrews. They, ha they have faith, but their works are supposed to keep that faith. Christians, our salvation is faith, and your works don't keep it. All right, your works can fail for all you care and for all you know, but Jesus Christ will still hold you up. It is salvation by faith. Yeah. Yeah. There are different salvations. That, that's called dispensational salvations. The doctrine of dispensational salvations is very important. Again, I emphasize so much, if people criticize me, don't criticize me without watching my dispensationalism playlist. But uh, if you don't have time, I would recommend watching Dispensa Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis to Revelation. That's the title of my video. We'll explain very thoroughly that this makes a lot of sense and it sorts out every confusion in the Bible pretty much. If not all, then 90% of it. The Calvinists are wrong about this and let me debunk them quickly. I know it's 10 now, so... Oh, it's nine. Excuse me. I, I jumped it one hour ahead. Okay, that was weird. I was like, whoa, I went way over time. All right. I'm still in a different time plane. <laughs> so, all right. Let me, uh, let me make a long story short, if I can make a long story short. Now, the modern Bible translation, some of them will change the word testament to covenant. They will do that. The reason why they will do that is because they want to support some Calvinist doctrine or notion. That's why they want to do that. It's not covenant, it's testament. Now, they might argue that the context of Hebrews 8, remember Hebrews 8? It never said covenant, it said, I mean, it never said testament, it said covenant, right? A new covenant he makes. Remember I told you that people messed up in that doctrine and they think that's New Testament? New Covenant, so they apply Hebrews 8 to Christians when it's not for us, it's for Jews. Why? Because the word is different. This is New Covenant, and this New Covenant is for Jews. Hebrews chapter 9 is New Testament, which you and I as New Testament Christians fall under. So Hebrews 9 will apply that to us. But even more so dispensationally for Hebrews 8 and 9, the New Testament can apply to Jews and Gentiles. New Covenant can apply to Jews and Gentiles. All right, let me explain how that works, okay? How that works is as follows. You'll notice right here, Old Testament, okay? Then we see right here, New Testament. In the New Testament, we see in this whole time period, if you're not lost, all right, we see Jews right here and Jews, right? Then we see a bracket here called Gentiles, which unfortunately we don't have time to go over. I want to go over that interesting thing, but we don't have time. The point is, is that Gentiles are in a bracket here, but if the Gentiles were not inserted here, this would have been all Jewish. It would have been all Jewish. But because the, Gentile, because the Jews rejected the Messiah, God turned to Gentiles. That's why Gentiles were inserted here and the New Covenant can apply to them. But remember right here, New Testament does not end with our Christian church age. New Testament continues on from tribulation to all the way to literally the end of Revelation. So if it continues on all the way to the end, Christians notice Gentiles, Gentile Christians are not here. This is under Jewish times. 
If there's going to be a lost Gentile there who wants to be saved, he can't follow the Christian Gentile program. He's going to have to follow the Jewish program. So the Jews are in the focus again. Not the Gentile program, the Jewish program. The Gentile program for Christians, excuse me. So Gentiles notice they're raptured out. So because they're raptured out, there's no application there. Notice the New Covenant applies here for Gentiles and then one for Jews. So New Testament covers Gentile timeline as well as the Jews in their timeline. Long story short, here we go. The idea is this, how the New Testament applies to uh, tribulation Jews as the author is writing Hebrews chapter 9 is that they're, they're going to have to go by the blood of Christ, not by the blood of animals. So in the tribulation, you see plenty of those verses, which I showed you before as well. Revelation chapter 12, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to see that they cannot disgrace the blood of Christ. That's why they have to maintain their faith with their works. Otherwise, they're stomping out the blood of Christ again. So when they apply the blood of Christ, they're applying it onto themselves. See, that's a work system. The Bible shows in Revelation chapter 7, they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. So that's tribulation Jews. We don't do that. We Christians, Gentile, during this Gentile timeline, are, are washed by Jesus Christ himself. Amen. We receive the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1 and Revelation 7 shows the distinction. Revelation 1 shows Christians churches that John is talking to, and they are washed by Christ. But in Revelation 7, those Jews in the tribulation, they wash their robes in the blood of Christ. See, there's a distinction how they apply the blood of Christ. So the New Testament Gentile, Gentiles in the New Testament are washed by the blood of Christ, saved by faith, not by works. And then in our fellowship, we can plead the blood. In the tribulation saints, their fellowship is part of their salvation. And when they plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, they have to do their works as they continually trust in that blood of Christ. So that's how it works in the New Testament. New covenant is as follows. New covenant for the church age. Uh, we receive uh, Jesus Christ, he mentioned in Matthew 27. And some of these uh, onliners, they are just so unscriptural, uneducated, and they, they act like they sound educated, some of these Calvinists and other people. But they point out Matthew 27, Jesus said, this blood is a new covenant, so to speak. So, uh, oh, so that's Christian. That doesn't apply to Jews. No, you fool. You missed out Hebrews 8. That is Jews. We, cover, we thoroughly covered that. But we also admit and believe Gentile Christians have a part in that. Why? Because Jews rejected it. And then when God applies it to Gentiles, it's a different operation here. The operation right here is that it's by faith, not by works. Again, uh, the Pauline epistles show that thoroughly. But the Jews, they have to do plenty of works. The evidence is the general epistles in themselves, especially the book of Hebrews, where it showed their faith has to be maintained with works. We thoroughly saw that. If you want to act Calvinist and go by expository and exegesis versus eisegesis, by context, by context, why do they deny the context of Hebrews itself and play around with other verses, Matthew 27 and other places for New Covenant? <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, I, I, pull, I pull the moat out of your own eye, you Calvinists. They criticize us going scripture with scripture and not going by context. Notice how they deviated context right here by going by scripture with scripture. How funny with those guys. But anyway, long story short, all right, I'm not going to go on a rant on them. Uh, this is how G Gentile Christians have access to that new covenant. The new covenant operates in two different ways. New, uh, uh, the new covenant operates with two different people, thus two different ways. Same thing with New Testament. Same thing with New Testament. Have you ever tried to give one same thing to two different people and then it can operate in different ways? Use common sense, man. That happens in life, all right? Trust me, you give spice to me and Tom, give me that same spicy level to me and Tom, we're to two different people, we're gonna, it's gonna operate very differently in both of our stomachs. All right. That's just common sense life. Notice how theologians, Calvinists, anti-dispensationalists, replacement theo theology, theologians, they have no common sense, let alone uh, education or Bible knowledge. So you better be a Bible believer. That's a long story short on that one.
All right, so now we understand how this dispensationally works, and then I'll explain this bracket part more, which will be interesting in our next Wednesday Bible study. Lord, dismiss us now with your blessing. Help us to go home safely. Thank you so much for food tonight. We came full now. Now we can go back to our homes full with your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.